But it's just a PDF. Yeah. That's weird. Okay. Put it in okay. Yeah. Just a just a, yeah, I know. I saw okay. something on my desk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for clearing <laughs> out. <laughs> 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 Little bit. Hmm? Yeah, exactly. Almost 2020. It's much better than that. This is why you do that. I still only have two of the six for that this year. That was easy. Coloration. There you go. It's right here. Okay. I was just like joking around. So I'm going to get my email. So, yes. Well, that again, I'm probably going to go out in the field this week. It's not that we can get it. It's already I don't have any audio. Oh, you just I, have animation? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so, I realized Right. Okay. So, Thursday is back with Sorry. I'm going to let you start this stream. Okay. It's already stream. Oh. Okay. 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 Yeah. We've only had two body with six minutes here, so why long hour sound and uh, your username and then type of God. And then on your code is twenty seven inches as that's our end game. I don't know what to do. Some of the fellows who are in charge of going off all of the part of the region. Oh, okay. These are mostly fresh water. That's really good. And at UK. Oh, I'm on Okay. So what am I supposed to be on the MIT? I don't know. No, I actually told him I gave him a pass. Good. He's been, he's been all last. And I was sort of the fish out of water. He's, he's here, but he just fell. Who's the only marine no, person? I think that's it. I can't remember. I think so. I think so. I have to. Mm. Yeah. Okay. What you said you do I need to be on a different network or is it just going? You were going to do it for us. You are. Just kind of saying, why? Well, I'm not even like, like, on top of it, it's like, the like, 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 Looking at the computer right there. Okay. Um, Spyro on uh, the right. Okay. Um, How are you? Got your popsicles. <laughs> I'm waiting for you to send me the popsicle. information. <laughs> <They're made laughs> the no, I, I, know, I, know, I knew that. I knew that. I think we should do it. I'll get you all this stuff, stuff you need if you find somebody to talk to. They don't smell. Well, that's the original problem. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay, now we got it. Oh, okay. okay. So yeah, you did actually have to be on the MIT network. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. Let's minimize that. Okay. Okay. Oh. 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 Oh.
when it's done. Yeah. Oh, it's great. Oh, it's great. Oh, it's great. Is everything all done? And, 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 yeah. Yeah. No, you're yeah. Yeah. Sure all set. Okay, yeah, we're all set. Okay. All right. Sorry, technical difficulties. We'll get started. Right. Well, thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, for the past two years, MIT Sea Grant has uh, focused its research funding on ocean acidification. And today, uh, from approximately 12 to 2, we're going to hear from our funded researchers from 2016. And uh, 2017. Um, the projects, uh, the updates from 2016 will be a little longer because they had a little longer to, to work on their, uh, on their research. And then 2017 will probably be some updates on uh, their project plans where they intend to go with it. Um, so it looks like we're going to start with Scott Tony. Yeah. Um, so just let me know if I'm, you know, how you want the timing as it goes along. If I'm I, I a little over. Okay. Um, so this is work that uh, Jenny Rubin, myself, uh, Jeff Coles from uh, UMass Dartmouth, and also Jim Churchill. This is our third report, so we're about, you know, two thirds ish through the, the research project. Um, what I'm going to talk about very briefly is listed here. We'll, we uh, completed as part of this project an analysis of the um, nitrogen inputs into Buzzards Bay, and one of the elements of that was to look at uh, wastewater inputs on a regional basis. Uh, that work I reported on uh, last winter and last summer, and that's actually now been published and is available. I'll talk a little bit about where we are in terms of some of the sampling for wastewater treatment uh, and, and coastal water sampling. Uh, talk a little bit about our numerical modeling and synthesis efforts, and a little bit about our, our outreach. So to frame the science that we're working on, um, we're really interested in how um, wastewater treatment plants, among other factors, could be affecting coastal acidification in the Buzzards Bay estuary. So the estuary is shown down there uh, in the bottom left-hand corner. Uh, Woods Holes, um, to orient you, Woods Holes down here. Uh, this is New Bedford. And so it's a mix of uh, sort of a suburban um, landscape on the Cape Cod side and a mix of agriculture and uh, uh, industrial slash urban on the uh, western border of Buzzards Bay. Uh, we've been working for a while looking at water quality issues, but the project was motivated by the idea that there's a growing uh, number of wastewater treatment plants uh, shown in the red dots. Those are surface discharge treatment plants. The blue are subsurface groundwater discharge plants. Uh, and if you look at the catchment area for the basin, um, the number of housing units has been growing around the bay over the last several decades. Um, but the number of housing units on septic has actually flattened and started to decline. And what's been going up with time is the number of houses on, on sewer. And so one way of thinking about this is you're bringing nutrients and organic matter, concentrating them from across various different smaller catchment basins, and then discharging the effluent out in a, in a very point source. And so we were interested to see what would be the impact of those point sources. Could, are they detectable? Would they have impacts on local ecosystems or aquaculture or things along that line? Um, so the first product from our study is a paper by Shauna Williamson, uh, myself, Jenny, and others, uh, was basically doing a nitrogen budget for the basin. Uh, and with Sea Grant funding, we added a fairly substantial component looking at the wastewater treatment plants. That came out as an open access paper uh, in January. Um, the two areas that we've been focusing on this study, uh, one is down in the uh, Bottom left-hand corner is New Bedford Fairhaven. So this is New Bedford Harbor. If anybody's been there, there's a discharge both in the harbor and then off of Clark's Point outside of the, outside of the harbor, and then Wareham. And um, I've reported a little bit in past about the Fairhaven in New Bedford, and I'm going to concentrate today on new results out of the Wareham, which is a very different system than New, New Bedford, because Wareham actually dumps and discharges into a uh, tidal estuary river system. 
So where we are in ter terms of field sampling is um, we did two samplings last year during the field season at New Bedford Fairhaven. We'll have one more this uh, late fall. Uh, one of the things we found is that um, making some of the measurements during the summer is really confounded by local biological activity. So we're trying to get baselines for each of the sites, both in the summer and in um, a late fall when there's lower biological activity. So we can contrast that and sort of separate out the treatment plant from other biological, local biological factors. Um, we also had one sampling in Wareham in November. Uh, we have plans for another sampling in Wareham uh, in a few weeks time, where in addition to a boat-based sampling, we're going to, with collaborators, bring along a Jediac, which is the small little yellow sort of autonomous surface drone that can give us uh, more continuous mapping uh, around the discharge plume. This is working with Rue Nicholson at Hui. Uh, and then we plan on doing a, a late fall sampling in New Bedford to get that that seasonal contrast. Uh, we also have, uh, with leverage funding from the uh, MacArthur <coughs> Foundation, uh, we have an ongoing monthly sampling that we have about two years of data in New Bedford and Wareham and some ongoing work in some of the other uh, coastal, uh, coastal estuaries. Uh, so drilling in a little bit to Wareham, so Wareham is at the head of the bay. So this is the Cape Cod Canal, the bridges to the Cape. Uh, this is the Wareham treatment plant, circled in red. And then the two, um, so uh, this is the Wareham River, sometimes called the Aguam River. Um, and then these are two of our long-term sampling sites that are further out away from the river basin. So we have sort of an in-member, uh, a bay in-member to compare against. So we've done sampling. Uh, I should say Jenny and Jim have done sampling. Um, in the river, uh, right at the discharge, a little bit upstream, and then downstream. Um, let's see if I can start the animation. One of the things that's uh, really interesting about this system, and this is some of our modeling results. This is FECOM. Uh, it's, it's a whole regional model, but I'm just showing the, the actual river, and there's the treatment plant is we're right in a system with a large salinity gradient and a lot of tidal, tidal variations. So there's a lot of, in addition to sort of gradual flushing uh, due to freshwater inputs, um, the analysis depends a lot on where you are in the tidal cycle uh, and where that discharge plume ends up. So this is just showing the salinity and velocity parameters. Uh, and we've been using the model to help us align ourselves with the um, uh, align the field data. So the sampling, the discharge spot is right here. Here's the treatment plant. The sampling that we did last summer sort of was a little upstream and downstream. Um, and if you look at the sampling data, for example, for pH, uh, this is oriented where the discharge site is at zero distance. Um, and we go about a little less than a kilometer downstream, downstream of that. Right at the discharge site, you see a substantial decline in pH. So this is going from roughly about 7.8 down to about 7.2. Uh, in terms of PCO2, the background is maybe around six or 700 ppm. This is going up well above 2,000. So there's a very strong local signal. And what we need to then work out is what is the sort of regional signal and what is the fate of that, of that uh, low pH acidified water. To put this in scale, you know, the pre-industrial to present open ocean decline in pH from acidification is about 0.1. And looking forward through this century, it's about another 0.2 to 0.3. So locally, you're getting a signal that's larger than what you'd expect on a global scale over the next over you know the next 50 to 100 years so it is a local very large signal um, but we've done taken the same using the end members that we've gotten both from treatment plant samples and from right at the discharge we've put uh, pH into the model 
And what you see is that, that right at the discharge plume, you'll get a large burst of low pH that then gets pushed back and forth with the tidal cycle. Um, we're doing modeling, Jim's been doing modeling for two seasons, a low discharge period where there's low freshwater <laughs> output from the river and a high discharge to see if we can see uh, how that affects the size of, of the signal. Um, in addition to pH measurements, um, so we have pH measurements made by a probe. We've also collecting dissolved inorganic carbon alkalinity samples. Um, this is just the map showing the, there's the treatment plant. This is the local um, Wareham River sampling. These are our two long-term sampling sites. Um, one of the things that's very clear is you see in the in the region near the discharge, these are now plotted against salinity. At these <clears throat> intermediate salinities where the discharge is, you see elevated DIC over alkalinity. So there's a gradual dilution curve as you head towards, fre towards the freshwater end member where DIC and alkalinity both decrease. So this is our, our bay end member. You see this long-term decline and then a bump up right near the discharge site you know, salinity ranges around four, and it shows up as elevated DIC over alkalinity. Uh, one of the things that we were surprised about is that you also see a bump up off the dilution curve from alkalinity. Um, the plant does try to somewhat buffer pH. So if, if they weren't adding, they actually add fly ash to try to increase the alkalinity and somewhat buffer the pH. If it wasn't for that, that pH drop would be much larger. So one of the things moving forward is to think about what are the management implications of, you know, how, how accurate do they need to be in terms of adding alkalinity in order to reduce this pH, the, the low pH water. Um, we've put, those were observations. These are now modeling results where we've used um, uh, we, we put in the treatment plant, and these are now anomalies on that sort of background dilution curve. So distance from the plant in terms of alkalinity, dissolved inorganic carbon, and nitrogen. Um, the sort of final element of our project, in addition to synthesizing the field data we've already worked on, is to uh, add some of the biological components that will be utilizing this very large nitrogen source. There's a point nitrogen source. Even, even though the plant is trying to remove a lot of the nitrogen, they still have a threshold where they're allowed to release a certain amount of nitrogen. Um, and that's going to form a biological, basically a biological algal bloom. And you see that in the, I didn't put the chlorophyll, I don't think, in here. You see a large bloom uh, right at the discharge site. Uh, and that will be acting to draw, draw down DIC in that plume as well. Uh, and then the other aspect of the modeling that we're working on is the far field effects. So we have sampling up here in the river. We have some sites here uh, as baseline in the bay. Um, this is showing uh, over time that there's that tidal sloshing back and forth, but there's also a gradual discharge of fresh water from the system. And we've been starting using the model to track <coughs> how long it takes that plume to exit into the head of the bay. And this would be really useful to give a background for uh, what the potential impact of an acidification signal might be across the head of the bay. And this is just showing the time series at various different sites. You see, obviously, the tidal cycle, but this long-term uh, exit of the plume from the, uh, from the river system. The last thing that we've been working on, sort of, you know, on the side is our outreach effort, and Jenny's been really instrumental in this as well as the field sampling, uh, working with the Buzzards Bay Coalition. So the Buzzards Bay Coalition has a, a science center, discovery center at the right in Woods Hole. It's right next to the ferry terminal to Martha's Vineyard. They get roughly 5,000 visitors per year. Um, this was, this just went in. We now have a a little ocean, ocean acidification hands-on experiment uh, with some background information, you know, um, uh, 
of what ocean acidification is. You can play, you know, blow into a cup, add a pH indicator, really see what the effect of CO2 is. We've used this kind of experiment many times in schools and other sort of uh, uh, public science demonstrations, but they've been one off. This will now be a standing display, and we hope we'll get a lot of um, foot coverage, or foot traffic over the summer and really be able to start to spread the word about this. So um, I'm not sure where we are, where, where we are for time, but um, that's a quick overview of where we are in terms of, of things we need to do. Uh, we have uh, two more samplings, one in the summer and one in the fall at the different sites. Uh, we need to do some uh, more work on the numerical modeling and then synthesizing that data. In particular, one of the things, the synthesis of this MacArthur data set, which is sort of a seasonal cycle across the bay, is going on in parallel with other funding. And hopefully we'll be able to bring that together um, by and present that uh, at the fall winter meeting. So I'll stop there and take questions. And you know, either questions for me or Jenny, because she's doing a lot of a lot of this work. The, uh, the, the plume from the wastewater treatment plant, is that pulse tile or is that continuous? It, it's a continue, it's a continu pretty much a continuous discharge. <laughs> We're modeling it. It's, I think it's like uh, 750,000 gallons a day is the rough discharge rate, but I don't think there's a lot of diurnal cycling of that. There is some seasonality in that. Uh, and then the other thing the plant does is they, they, have different, um, I think, it's ter is it tertiary for the whole all, whole summer? It's tertiary all year. They have different um, threshold. maximum nit yeah, nitrogen threshold levels. So I think it's April to the end of October. They're, I think, only allowed to discharge up to three milligrams per liter. That's their threshold. Um, from the November to March period, they're, they don't have that threshold. It's a higher threshold. So there's reduced treatment that happens during that period. Another reason why we want to sample the summer, so, so we're seeing sort of both sides of the treatment. Is there any um, biological reason for that reduction? Uh, they, or is it just its capacity? Like no, it's well, less? it's because the there's less biological activity during the winter period when the water's cold, and so there's less concern about algal blooms and that kind of thing. Is you, the sampling method across the river, are you taking it at one spot or are you taking it at like three spots, one on both sides, one in the middle? It's a pretty narrow river. This is the, Jenny, if you want to. Yeah, so the, the Aguam River at that point is not particularly wide. Um, so we basically tracked along the middle um, in the main channel okay. of the river, um, upstream from the plume, and then worked our way downstream. The sampling grid we did for Fairhaven was more of a two dimensional sampling grid. Um, and this is one of the advantages of bringing the Jetty Act is, you know, we're, you know, we're trying to sample during a tidal cycle from a small boat. The Jetty Act would give us uh, a little more coverage in both sites. I got the, this, this salinity, alkalinity, and salinity DIC relationships. Mm -hmm. Now, when you ratio DIC to alkalinity, that was also related to salinity? Right. But I'm trying to understand, how, how would you interpret that? Well. If so, so if you didn't have the treatment plant, you you'd have two end member mixing, mm -hmm. right? So you would expect a sort of a, a freshwater end member that has one DIC alkalinity <laughs> ratio and a, a coastal end member. Mm -hmm. What we're seeing is a perturbation to that because the plant is, although the plant is adding fly ash to add alkalinity, mm -hmm. the DIC load that they're adding is higher. So that's why you get that sort of bump in the in the ratio, and it turns out to be a good way of tracking uh, the plume discharge. Uh -huh. You could also, I guess, look at um, fly ash. It's a it's ca it's a calcium based mineral, right? You might be able to look at the ratio of the uh, kind of the calcium anomaly, right? Secondary. Yeah, we don't. We well, we're not we're not set up to do calcium we would I mean we could do that but we'd have to yeah. um, there are methods for doing cal obviously calcium in seawater but we'd have to 
work with somebody who has that, that method up and running. I was wondering if you could speak to what their process is for determining how much fly ash is added right now. That I don't, that's one of the things we need to go back to the treatment plant because I, I, we were, I, 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 I was surprised, I'm not genuinely surprised, we were surprised at how much alkalinity they're actually adding and I don't know what their decision rules are for that. Okay. Um, that's one of the things we need to go back, but they've been really, they've been really approachable and really helpful. I was hoping, could you speak to what, what other practices might be changed at the wastewater treatment plant level because of the work you're doing? Like what else, what might your work inform in terms of management? Um, I mean, the other aspect is citing for, um, is citing for, you know, if, if you can't reduce through for example, adding alkalinity, it's very hard for their process to get rid of the carbon, right? Because they're basically trying to respire the carbon and not release a lot of organics. So I, I don't think there's a lot of leverage on the DIC side. So then it's the, um, if you can't balance out the alkalinity, then it's using that information to determine, you know, what the impact range would be and how that would affect regional planning for siting, for example, of aquaculture projects. So, um, and then things like that. I didn't put the map in there. We've got a um, Joe Costa from the uh, uh, from the Buzzard Bay Estuarine uh, Research Center has a very nice documentation of the different um, resource map areas for the bay, and so that'll we're kind of going to overlap and overlap. Who are the saturation states like? Um, <coughs> they're really low. They're, um, they're down in the 0 0.2, 0 0.3, right near the right near the discharge site. Um, one of the things, and we've got to work some with Alec. We have the advantage that Alec is right there. Is um, you know the you know alkalinity and DIC are directly measured. The saturation state is being calculated, and there's some we there are some assumptions that are going into that that. Uh, Thermodynamics we're using are sort of open seawater thermodynamics, and we need to make some modifications for this sort of freshwater wastewater treatment and number. So that's on our that's on our list. Also, if you're getting calcium from the fly ash, maybe we can make it yeah. a bigger little chart here. Right. You your uh, calcium. I mean, we we can measure calcium, uh, just um, but the the precision of that. Um, has to be high enough so that the calculation really makes a difference. Otherwise, uh, there's no actually. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot. Yeah, the there's a lot of calcium in seawater yeah. already. Yeah. So, so fresh water is different. I was gonna say, the last time I measured calcium was was a flame AA. So <laughs> that was a long time ago. Okay. Great. Thanks. I shut down and you got Yeah, I just need that remote right in front of you, Robin. Sorry. Thank you. So we're going to move on to our next talk. On how ocean acidification and warming oceans affect small booster shell growth. Yep, thank you. Hi, I'm Christine. I'm a grad student at UMass Boston, and I've been working on this lobster project with my advisor, Robin. So I'm just going to go through a bit of our findings so far, looking at the effects of warming and acidification on early stage American lobsters. I'm going to give you a bit of background information first. Um, the historic range of the American lobster is from Cape Hatteras down in North Carolina up to Newfoundland, but a substantial portion of this population subsists in the Gulf of Maine, and it supports the number one fishery in the entire country, the American lobster fishery. Uh, as of last year, they had over $530 million landed in Maine alone, so it's a significant component to the local economy. We also know that the Gulf of Maine is suffering from the effects of climate change, so it's warming at an exceptionally fast rate. Um, faster than 99% of the world's oceans, and it is also acidifying. So not only are we seeing a decrease in pH, we're seeing a decrease 
in the availability of carbonate ions that the lobsters use to precipitate minerals in their shell. The lobster shell is mostly composed of chitin fibers. I guess you can't really see this. Um, in this infographic here, you can see the breakdown of the, the shell layering. There are three main layers, the outer epicuticle, exocuticle, and endocuticle. That's mostly this chitin. And interspersed within there is the minerals that gives it its structural integrity and hardness. There are also these um, channels, these pore canals running throughout the entire shell that are important in transporting inorganic molecules in the biomineralization process. They're also lined, this is a confusing graphic, but this purple bit here is meant to represent calcium appetite. Um, so they're lined with this calcium carbonate appetite. And it's thought that this particular mineral is, um, provides a bit of a buffer against bacterial infection, which leads me into another big component of our research, which is epizootic shell disease. Um, this is something that other researchers have noticed incidences of like the bacteria is actually being found at these pore sites and these cetal pits. Um, it was first really noted in 1997 in Long Island Sound. It's been since moving northward. As early as 2004, there has been sightings as far as north as Cape Ann. Uh, it is also found to correlate with increasing temperatures. Ugly loss or lobster syndrome. So this sort of leads me into what our research questions are. We're looking at these early stage lobsters and their shell development, and we want to look at three main components. We're looking at the mineralogy, so changes in distribution and abundance of calcium carbonate minerals within the shell. We're looking at gene expression, especially with those genes that are involved in biomineralization and um, chitin production. And we want to find out whether or not um, these stressors are going to have any effect on incidence and prevalence of epizootic shell disease. So when we do our experiments, we rear our lobsters at the New England Aquarium lobster hatchery. And once they reach the appropriate stage for the experiment we're doing, we transfer them over to UMass Boston, where we have our CO2 dosing system set up. That's this right here. I've outlined here an example of one of our recent experiments where we looked at uh, these effects on juvenile lobsters. In this case, we had four treatments. The control was at a pH of 8 and a temperature of 17 Celsius, and this was reflective of what they were raised in at the aquarium, so that was set as the baseline. And we dropped the pH to 7.6, raised the temperature to 21. So those were the four treatments, replicated three times, and randomized across our system. The first thing we wanted to look at then was if there was any difference in growth. Well, there was not. So this was actually because uh, the experiment was cut short at 18 days um, due to high mortality. Now, the high mortality, it turns out, was not at all related to treatment conditions, but due to the particular housing setup we had them in. Um, this was what we had been rearing them in at the aquarium. It's also the setup we use when we do larval experiments but it seemed to be pushing the limits of what the lobsters would tolerate as far as space. Also let some of them escape and cannibalize their neighbors, so we had some mortality from that. Um, I've since done a few trial error experiments to come up with a better design, and this one has uh, succeeded immensely. We have almost no mortality now with a bit bigger space on substrate and zero chance of escape. So going back to our experiments, when we, when we do the experiments, we're also able to do some qualitative um, observations throughout the experiment. For instance, this guy on the left died when he was molting. Most of the, the deaths that have occurred during experiments um, were mid-molt like this, and kind of looks like he got stuck pulling a shirt over his head. Um, we also see mid-experiment deaths that have drastic changes in the texture of the shell and we start to see this sort of pitting and, and strange holes. When we think about what the lobster should look like growing naturally under healthy conditions, um, it would look something like this under a scanning electromicroscope. Everything looks where it should be. The shell is relatively smooth. You can see evidence of cetal pit sensory hairs. But under our low pH high temperature treatments, we start to see deformities in the shell, pitting, signs of lesions, and as well, incidence of bacteria around those cetal pits and pore canals. So we're in the process of um, analyzing the lesions and disease. 
we're using ImageJ software to get the area of these lesions, and then we can get a percent coverage of lesion to, to shell uh, and compare that between treatments. And we can also use point EDS analysis on the electron microscope to get an elemental composition of the bacteria at the site of infection, as well as the general mineralogy uh, of the area, so we can get a better sense of what's going on at those locations. Um, that leads me into what we actually do for our mineralogical uh, comparisons. We do a similar EDS analysis that's actually giving us a spectral map of elements and their distribution um, across the image. These are cross sections of lobster shells, and the elements that we have isolated here are calcium and magnesium that are uh, key components for, for minerals, and it gives you a qualitative impression of where these elements are and their density in which locations of the shell. So we can then qualitatively compare between treatments and also get a quantitative sense of um, differences based on weight percent of these elements. So we can then compare those statistically uh, and look at some preliminary findings. This <clears throat> figure shows two treatments, the control and then the multi-stressor treatment. Carapace length on the X and weight percent of calcium on the Y. <clears throat> Looking at this, you don't really see much of a trend um, in the control treatment based on uh, weight percent of calcium by length. However, there does seem to be a bit of an interaction effect of the pH and temperature on uh, weight percent of calcium, and it's a greater effect on smaller animals than larger. So again, this is all preliminary findings that we're, we're moving forward with, and when we actually do a statistical comparison of it, we find that there is a significant difference in the percent calcium found between those two treatments. Moving on to our final bit, which is really the transcriptomic stuff, we did manage to come up with a unique technique to isolate RNA from the dermal tissue just beneath the carapace, and we managed to get really good quantities of it, which is all this table is showing you. Um, we then sequenced it and got between 30 and 64 million reads for each sample, which was really good. All this graphic is showing is our general process for this. Um, we've isolated and sequenced the RNA, and then we built a reference transcriptome, which we then mapped reads to, to determine differential gene expression. This stuff I'm really excited about. We only got this stuff a couple days ago. So I can share some of it with you, but um, minimal interpretation so far. This is a Venn diagram that simply depicts the number of genes that were differentially expressed in each treatment. By and large, the most genes were found in the multi-stressor treatment, over 2,000 were differentially expressed compared with control. Um, we set our p-value here to 0.01. We had it at 0.05, but there was over 20,000 genes being differentially expressed. Um, and so we now have just over 4,500. We then looked at um, specific genes related to calcification in the shell, uh, CASP2 and CP14. These are directly related to the production of calcium carbonate. and you can see treatment on the X and relative expression level over control in the Y. There is a um, upregulation in the acidified only treatment for CAST2, as well as the acidified only and multi-stressor treatment for CP14. And I hope you notice the difference in the Y axis here. So there is a very big difference um, in expression. We then looked at genes related to cuticle growth, and we see the same thing. Most of the um, genes here are being upregulated under the low pH treatment, some also in the multi-stressor treatment. So we're starting to see some of that interaction effect coming into play for some of these genes. And that is most notable in our last section here, which we're looking at genes related to chitin formation and chitinase. Um, in every single one of these genes, they are being upregulated under conditions of low pH and high temperature. So really interesting stuff. Don't have a lot more to tell you about it besides this, um, <laughs> but still cool. So just briefly, I'll recap with that we've seen uh, some differences in mineralogy so far, and we'll continue to go down those, those lines of analysis. Same with the gene expression. There is definitely some uh, upregulation of these important genes under uh, multi-stressor treatments. And we have observed incidents of shell disease, um, and we're in the process of doing those analyses. Now, looking forward, we'd like to do two final experiments, one juvenile and one larval. 
and we would like to expand our set points to have at least three pH against three temperatures so we can get a better idea of what that trend might be. And we'll complete the transcriptomic mineralogical and, and disease analyses so that we can finally get to some cool science communication uh, through the aquarium and publish our results. Uh, so with that, I will take questions. What do, what, do, what do the bacteria do uh, when they're sitting on the carapace? Yeah, good question. Um, so there's bacteria on the carapace all the time. And the bacteria they think cause, that causes shell disease is ubiquitous in the water, so it's just around. Um, the exact etiology of it is not necessarily specified and still a bit elusive. But what people think is that there are certain types of bacteria that get on. They get the foothold, perhaps, in these cetal pits and bore canals. Um, they start eating away at the chitin. So certain bacteria that are chitinolytic. Right? Um, <laughs> so just by secreting something? Yeah, yes. Enzyme. By secreting an enzyme, so they deteriorate the chitin. And then that lesion formation then allows the bacteria that causes the epizootic shell disease to get in and to spread. Um, yeah. <clears throat> is there a difference in the surface of what's on the, um, the, the lobsters in sort of normal situations versus the low pH situations? In other words, is there something that's causing this change in terms of bacterial infections? I always, well, I always assumed it was related somewhat to high temperature for because Connecticut was starting to see the higher temperatures right. and their lobster populations went down and had the disease, yeah. Right, right. Well, that's something that we're starting to see, yeah. So we have seen that trend in our, our high temperature treatments. Um, and with that multi-stressor treatment, especially that combines the high temp with that low pH, we're seeing those structural differences in the shell and that higher prevalence of the bacteria in the water, we are seeing that higher presence of bacteria on the shell. For our low pH only treatment, um, I don't quite remember whether or not we were seeing an excessive number of bacterial presence, um, at least not compared to what we are seeing with high temp and multi-stressor. Yeah, so really the concern with the low pH is, is the combination of the two stressor points there. Because um, like you said, the bacteria does increase with the temperature and we just expect it to be a bigger problem for the lobsters because their shells are, are weaker in the low pH. Yeah. Well, do people ever do shrimp studies? Yeah. Is it kind of like a fruit fly equivalent to something that turns over pros much faster than the equivalent? I've never thought of it that uh, way. <laughs> um, they must, I'm sure, do things like that. I mean, we should probably consider it. Um, but I know there are studies that look specifically at shrimp and do similar <coughs> similar work with acidification. Um, but the lobsters turn over pretty fast for us. We are, we are pretty able with getting eggers, and they hatch fairly quickly and grow fairly quickly at these early stages. Thank you. So there must be something that's changing the ones that keep off the bad guys. Next up, we have that Reese from Northeast. The pills, everything. Hmm. It has bacteria living. So yes. Something that they may have. That's really interesting. Yeah, I don't know if you hold. Really get at that. Um, yeah, sorry, I your question. No, that's okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> I wonder then, you know, how we work at we should look at just the bacteria itself and how that's reacting to the situation. Um, but it is a funny thing, and I don't know how long people have been researching in exotic shell disease now, but. And, uh, they, yeah, All right, so next exactly up we have Justin Reese on, yes. from Northeastern uh, University. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. You just plug it in. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if we can run to see. <laughs> 
Justin Reese, a professor at uh, Northeastern University, um, working with uh, Carolina Bastidas uh, and my graduate student, Louise Cameron. And we're kind of at a similar stage as Scott, about two thirds of the way through the project. The, uh, the goal of the project is to look at the impacts of acidification on <coughs> calcification rates, um, shell structure, and the actual fluids from which organism uh, bivalves produce their shells and skeletons. Uh, the latter part, the extra paleo fluid work, is something we've just started to look at. It wasn't part of the original proposal, but I'll, I'm going to talk a little bit about it at the end of uh, today's presentation. So not only is it to look at the effect of facilitation on these different parts of, of, of commercially important bivalves, but it's also uh, an important part is to look across life stages. So our early life stage organisms more vulnerable than adult stage or vice versa. All right, so everybody's probably seen this curve. This is baseline atmospheric CO2 over the last 800,000 years. We go through roughly 100,000 year cycles between 200 and 300 uh, microatmospheres, mainly driven by um, uh, glacial periods, freezing up of, of uh, high latitude, uh, tundra environment shut the, shut, shuts down the carbon cycle, and you end up with a, uh, uh, a low CO2 signal during a glacial maximum, <clears throat> and high CO2 during interglacial. Uh, oh, since the Industrial Revolution, since we started burning fossil fuels uh, at very high rates, uh, we've departed from the last 800,000 uh, year baseline levels and jumped up about 30% up to 400 uh, uh, microatmospheres. And then over the next 100 to 200, maybe 250 years, uh, business, as, business as usual scenarios predict 
that will be up to 900 microatmospheres. So substantial changes compared to baseline, uh, baseline fluctuations driven by uh, glacial interglacial cycles. So what does this mean for, for the oceans? Um, a lot of people are familiar with this, but if there's anyone who's, uh, who's new to the area, this upper uh, plot shows atmospheric CO2 over predicted for the next century based on seven different uh, climate, social science, economic models. As atmospheric CO2 goes uh, up in the atmosphere, it, a lot of it dissolves in the ocean, forms carbonic acid. And that uh, our carbonic acid uh, dissociates into protons and bicarbonate. And those protons will uh, uh, bind to available carbonate ions, drawing down the carbonate ion concentration in seawater. And this is important because CO3 is the form of carbon that marine organisms use to build their calcium carbonate shells and skeletons. So as this value goes down, it may potentially be harder for marine calcifiers to build their protective shells and skeletons. Uh, this line here represents the point at which the aragonite form of calcium carbonate becomes undersaturated, in other words, which uh, it should begin to dissolve in organic aragonite, and this line represents the horizon at which calcite form of calcium carbonate produced by oysters, uh, coccolithophores, for example, will begin to dissolve. And the calcite is lower than the aragonite because aragonite is more soluble than the calcite polymorph. <clears throat> so what this shows is that by about the year 2070, aragonite producing organisms in, uh, in this graph for the Southern Ocean, well actually the shells will begin to actively dissolve away. And for calcite producing organisms, that level would be at about uh, 2130 to 2140. So just for perspective, <clears throat> Takes a, do you have a pointer by any chance? Uh, a physical pointer? No, I don't have anything. I'll just do it the old fashioned way. <laughs> <laughs> you can just. Um, all right, so just for perspective, I plotted the, uh, the last 50 years of, uh, of change just to, to show you that the pretty good values are consistent with what's actually been observed. All right, so why do we care so much about calcium carbonate? Because such a wide range of organisms in the ocean use it. Uh, bivalves, urchins, crustaceans, corals, calcifying algae, scallops, lobsters, crabs. And they all use this uh, mineral mainly uh, to protect themselves from predators. For instance, this quahog using its, uh, its uh, aragonite shell to protect itself from being pried open by a blue crab. Uh, thanks. I think this is the same. No, I don't know. I might, might blind somebody with that. Um, all right. So, yeah, without that, without that shell, their, their uh, ability to protect themselves is, uh, is severely compromised. So we have four basic pro uh, projects I wanted to discuss today that we've been working on, and they're all aimed at investigating the impact of commercially important mollusks, New England's commercially important mollusks, quahogs, oysters, scallops, uh, soft clams, hard clams, mussels. What's their vulnerability to acidification, and how does that vary across life stages? First project is a comparison of early stage and, and late stage for limpets, and also looking at that comparison in oysters. Uh, then we look at, uh, in about six different species of commercially important mollusks, we really zoom in, uh, similar to the types of images that Christine was showing for the, for the lobsters, the SEM high magnification images, we do the same type of imaging for the shells of these commercially important mollusks to see how the microstructure, the very building blocks of the skeletons of the shells, are being impacted by acidification. Uh, the third pro uh, project is to step away from calcification and isolate the effects of acidification on dilution, dissolution. So work out the dissolution kinetics of different types of biogenic carbonates. So, you know, 
what an organism, uh, the, the shell that an organism produces is going to be a balance of calcification at the growing site balanced by loss of shell at, in the unprotected portions or dissolution. So 99% of the acidification work is focused on the calcification side of the equation, but we also need to understand what's happening on the dissolution, the inorganic abiogenic dissolution side of the equation. And then fourth, I uh, just want to close talking about a novel pH microelectrode technique that we've developed and for inserting into the, the extra paleo fluid of marine bivalves to uh, actually measure how the pH of that fluid responds to acidification of the surrounding seawater. And so all the experiments were done at, uh, at uh, Northeastern University up here in the uh, in our old World War II bunker we have in the hillside. Great place for experiments. No windows to distract any graduate students. <clears throat> but, uh, and we've got running seawater from the ocean coming from uh, right off shore in a hot. A fully controlled experimental array for temperature, salinity, pH, lighting, uh, 72 tank capacity. So let's just jump right into the results. Uh, here we looked at a comparison of adult limpets and juvenile limpets. And we found that surprisingly, well, let me just define the axis here. We've got a aragonite saturation state on the x-axis, which is going to decrease as PCO2 increases. As CO2 goes up, pH, the water becomes more acidic, and the saturation state, how supportive of calcification that water is, decreases in this direction. So we did, uh, we did four and three CO2 levels saturation states for adults and juvenile lipids. <clears throat> and then we measured the calcification response of the shell in response to these different acidification treatments. Um, surprisingly, the adults didn't have a, uh, a linear negative response. Their calcification actually was enhanced by a moderate increase in CO2. Uh, and then it declined as extreme increases in CO2 uh, down to an aragonite saturation state of about one. So apparently they were able to utilize that extra carbon in the water through whatever uh, process and actually it benefited their calcification to a point and then it had a negative effect. However, when we looked at the juveniles, we didn't see that, uh, that benefit of a moderate acidification at all. We saw a strictly negative uh, response in the, juvenile, uh, in the juveniles. So this suggests that the early life stages of at least, the, uh, of at least lipids are more vulnerable to acidification than the adult stages. Now, we thought we had something worked out, and then we went to oysters and looked at the same comparison. We saw the exact opposite. The adult oysters were more vulnerable, unlike the lipids, and then the juveniles seemed to be less vulnerable, where they had no impact of acidification over the moderate increases in CO2, and then an extreme decrease under the highest CO2 levels. So lipids, the juveniles seem to be more vulnerable, Oysters, juveniles, seem to be more resilient. So this brings us into the second project, looking at actually how the shell structure changes under different CO2 conditions. So let's go back to the lipid uh, scenario here, where we have the juvenile lipids decreasing with increasing CO2. I put the markers on here just to let you know, 400, 900, about 2850 microatmospheres. <clears throat> corresponding to, to saturation states down to below one. Um, under the uh, control conditions, where we are now, 400 microatmospheres, you can see that the, the, uh, the juvenile stage limpet was well formed, no obvious defects. But under the high CO2 condition, not only did it grow more slowly, but the shell was uh, heavily deformed. Uh, these are uh, homologously arranged. So this portion of the shell is equivalent to this portion of the shell but it's completely lost its world. The perimeter of the shell is deformed and the entire surface is highly undulated. Uh, either it's gone through dissolution of its external surface or it was just uh, deposited in a haphazard manner uh, under the high CO2 conditions. So even though the juveniles are able to continue calcifying, albeit at a lower rate at 2850 ppm, the, the structure of the, the macro structure of the shell is obviously compromised. Now, how about the oysters? We saw a similar thing. Didn't see shell deformation, per se. The shape of the shell, the juvenile oysters, was intact. But under the high CO2 conditions, this outer layer is peeling away. This outer layer is the periostrum. It's an organic la layer 
that they assemble on the outside of their calcite mineral to kind of it's slightly hydrophobic and it protects the shell from uh, dissolution in uh, seasonal dissolution. Waters become un less saturated in the wintertime. That's how they get through the winters. What happens under highly acidic conditions, the bond, uh, the, the substrate upon which that periosteum attaches begins to dissolve away. And that causes the periosteum to peel away and delaminate from the surface, which then kind of as a positive feedback exposes more unprotected shell, which then begins to dissolve away at an even faster rate. So the high CO2 conditions triggers the delamination of the periosteum that then sends the, the shell into a kind of a positive feedback of dissolution, exposing more unprotected shell, which then will dissolve away faster. So moderate resilience to CO2 at the juvenile phase for oysters, but large impact on, on shell uh, structure. Also looked at the species of, uh, of quahog here under a similar range of saturation states. This is an aragonite producing clam has this predictable negative response to acidification. And the highest CO2 condition, it actually exhibits signs of net dissolution, which means it weighs weighed less at the end of the experiment than at the beginning of the experiment, even though it was still alive. Uh, these are just macroscopic images, not SEM images. Um, and they reveal that a healthy uh, cohog, which formed under normal CO2 conditions, uh, the surface is actually covered with a series of, uh, of ridges. And it's been worked out that these ridges, particularly the symmetry of these ridges, help the quahog burrow into sediments. It releases their foot, and as it wiggles, these ridges essentially allow them to grip, grip more effectively in one direction, which allows them to actually move down into the sediment. Under the high CO2 conditions, the first order ridges completely dissolve away because of their high surface area to volume ratio, and the asymmetry is lost. So not only have you changed the, the growth rate of the shell in the high CO2 conditions, but you also change the functional morphology of the shell, how these ridges assist the, the, uh, the clam in burrowing down into the sediments. Now I'll zoom in a little uh, closer with the scanning electron microscope. These are secondary electron images of the surface of the clam under normal CO2 and elevated CO2 conditions. And this is the, uh, the interior of the shell. So it's not the uh, exposed exterior portion, but the interior portion beneath the mantle where calcification occurs. So this is not uh, purely a product of dissolution of, of surface material. This is actually occurring at the site of calcification. Uh, under normal CO2 conditions, the aragonite crystals are tightly packed and uh, neatly arranged. While under the high CO2 conditions, you've got etching along grain boundaries partial dissolution of the surface, or if it's not partial dissolution, just more haphazard arrangement of the crystals. So both of the, all those things under the high CO2 conditions are going to most likely confer weaker strength and weaker resistance to fracture uh, when predators are trying to, to crush them. We looked at a soft shell clam as well. Another comparison, uh, highly ordered um, uh, kind of rosettes of aragonite that are precipitated as these growing <coughs> mounds. Each one is kind of clustered along a, a center of calcification out from which the aragonite needles radiate. These, uh, these aragonite bundles kind of uh, disaggregate under the high CO2 conditions and you get smaller clusters and the clusters seem to be uh, less, less organized in how they're arranged. So again, most likely conferring weaker resistance to crushing under high CO2 conditions. Now we're also in the process of, of doing biomechanical tests to figure out how do these ultrastructural changes actually impact the strength of the shell. So hopefully I'll be able to report on them later. Moving on to the oyster. Normal CO2 conditions, you see clusters of, of calcite grains uh, neatly arranged under the high CO2 conditions. You, uh, you also see the clusters of aragonite uh, needles, but you seem to have uh, etching along the grain boundaries, uh, and you also have missing crystals, which leave kind of a hollow framework. It's almost like if you, you were to build a house, but instead of putting uh, stacking bricks one upon the other, you're just putting, you're leaving a brick out every five bricks. That's basically what, what's happening under the higher CO2 conditions. And again, we're going to evaluate 
where does the rubber hit the road for these organisms in terms of, of uh, the, uh, the crushing strength and, and resistance to crushing using uh, biomechanical tests. Look at the species of base scallop. Again, so it's a very similar thing as we saw with the oysters. Uh, the crystals are arranged in kind of linear bundles that are tightly packed. So each one of these globs here is an actual calcite crystal. The calcite crystals are then organized into larger linear structures. Under the highest CO2 conditions, the boundaries between these linear structures, because of their higher, highest, higher surface to volume ratio along the edge, preferentially dissolve, leaving behind uh, a kind of a hollow framework compared to shell production under normal CO2 conditions. We also looked at a, a species, of, a very important species in New England, the uh, Atlantic sea scallop, uh, Plecopectin magalinicus. Magellanicus. We cultured this species at, at 6, 9, and 12 degrees Celsius and at four saturation states. So we had 12 treatments, each replicated three times. We didn't see too much of a temperature effect. You can see the whole CO2 constant temperature uh, was not significantly, uh, did not have a significant impact. But calcification rates did significantly decline with increasing CO2. And here we're at a saturation state of uh, about 0 0.7. So the shells weighed less at the end of the experiment than they did at the beginning. Under normal CO2 conditions, the uh, surface of the shell looks like this. Under higher CO2 conditions, it's chalk, uh, chalky, most likely the result of the partial dissolution. Looking, uh, using an SCM to zoom in on that shell surface, 50 micron scale bar here, you see uh, the uh, calcite crystals are arranged in plates that are overlapping, and these correspond to growth intervals. Under higher CO2 conditions, you have clear signs of dissolution of these ridges, not only removing calcite crystals from within the ridge, but also etching along the perimeter of the ridge, you know, changing the structure and therefore function of these shells. That was a look at the exterior. Quick look at the exterior. Interior shows well-formed calcite rhombs and reasonably well-formed calcite rhombs here, too. So even though the exterior of the shell is responding to acidification, the interior seems to be functioning as, as usual. And this raises the possibility that maybe some species have a, quite a bit of control over that internal fluid from which they're calcified. Once they form a shell and it's exposed to the surrounding seawater, then it just behaves basically uh, according to uh, abiogenic uh, dissolution kinetics. But in the interior, where they're modifying that extra paleo fluid, these well-formed crystals beneath the mantle, at least for the sea scallops, suggest that they're ex exhibiting some type of control. Uh, we looked at the species of mussel, blue mussel, another important species in New, in New England. And this was the only species of uh, bivalve that showed no statistically significant response to acidification, even all the way up to 2850 parts per million CO2. So that super high level that Scott presented right at the uh, <coughs> that, um, uh, effluent site, we actually, coincidentally, that was our high CO2 level, and the mussels were able to survive those conditions. If you look at the mussel, it's got um, a, a kind of a glossy periostrum here. And uh, th this periostrogum is, uh, is very hydrophobic. That's what gives it that sheen. It's got a lot, a lot of um, organic molecules in it that cause that reflectivity. It also keeps a lot of the water out and pre prevents it from dissolving under high CO2 conditions. That might be one reason that it's resistant to acidification. And a quick look at the interior of the, of the shells of the mussels. Unlike all the other mollusks we looked at, except for the sea scallops, there's Basically, no difference between the 400 and the 2850 PCO2 treatments in the interior. You've got the calcite crystals that are uh, relatively equivalent in shape, arranged in similar patterns, without any signs of etching along grain boundaries. So if any organism kind of represents a, a, a super, a super uh, bivalve with, in terms of OA resistance, it looks like the mussel uh, might be an example of this. But again, in order to maintain that those conditions favorable to calcification in the interior of the shell, they have to be exerting a lot of control over the, uh, the pH and carbonate chemistry of that extra paleo fluid. 
So that'll bring us to uh, the, the fourth topic. But let's let's talk a little bit about the third topic now. And this is uh, teasing apart the the impact of acidification on dissolution, shell dissolution. So when we measure the rate at which an organism produces its shell in, in the lab, we're measuring really the net calcification rate. And implicit in that measurement is the gross calcification, which is all the new mineral that that tissue produces, minus all the portion of all, every, every crystal in that shell that either disaggregates or dissolves uh, in, in the seawater. So every, almost every calcification rate we're met, we're, we report, even ones that are isotopically labeled, are going to, is going to be a measure of net calcification. And we really have no idea what the impact of acidification is on the gross dissolution of biogenic shells. We only know what it is for gross dissolution of carbonates, <laughs> of, uh, of abiogenic carbonates, which were calculated and worked out uh, empirically. So what we did is, is we did dissolution experiments, very similar to the uh, acidification experiments, but with just a much broader range of saturation states, and bringing CO2 levels not to 2,800, but up to 10,000, 15,000, to really get low, uh, uh, very low saturation states to induce dissolution. And we conducted this experiment on five uh, marine mollusks, oysters, conchs, blue mussels, hard clams, and soft clams. The axis here shows the aragonite saturation state, and here we have the relative dissolution rate expressed as a negative value. And we did the experiments at two temperatures, 10 degrees and 25 degrees. And for all the species, we see the classical dissolution profile. Once you get to undersaturated conditions, dissolution rates begin to accelerate exponentially. But we saw some other information here that was, was not predicted based upon previous work, which was very surprising. And the first one, is that under both temperatures, 10 and 25 degrees, all five species actually exhibit baseline dissolution or disaggregation of their shell, even in oversaturated conditions. So there's a portion of the shell that is constantly being dissolved or, or lost through disaggregation, even in oversaturated conditions. So these organisms are always battling that baseline dissolution when they're building their shell and skeleton. Another thing that these experiments showed is that dissolution rates increased when temperature increased from 10 to 25 degrees Celsius. Now, uh, this has been known for a long time that uh, dissolution rates should increase for abiogenic minerals under high temperature conditions. The rate equation for dissolution has temperature um, in, in the numerator, essentially, actually in the exponent. And, uh, but it's never really been discussed or, or shown for biogenic minerals. What it means is that in, high, in the higher temperature, higher CO2 ocean, not only will the higher CO2 make it harder for the organism to produce a shell or skeleton, but the higher tempers, well, temperatures will actually cause the shell to dissolve more quickly. So global warming will increase rates of dissolution of biogenic minerals. And that's something that we really never talk about, but it's an important thing to consider. Uh, another thing that this shows is that you have this baseline dissolution. A lot of people wonder what's causing this baseline dissolution. Doesn't make sense. Well, these are biogenic minerals, so they've got proteins embedded within them. They've got crystal defects uh, relative to the organic minerals that the solubility products were originally derived for. So, by having baseline dissolution in oversaturated conditions, this shows us that there's either a metastable, either a metastable phase, metastable mineral within that shell, which is more vulnerable to dissolution, like vaterite or brucite or some high magnesium calcite phase, or well, it could also mean that the solubility products that we're using for these biogenic shells are simply too low. I mean, they were derived for inorganic minerals without crystal defects and organics, so maybe the solubility products we need to use are really mineral specific, and we need to increase them to make realistic predictions. All right, I should say project four. We're on the last project now, and this is just kind of, a, I'll just give a quick overview because we really haven't made too much progress with this except for the initial proof of concept work. Um, there's, a, there's a layer of fluid between the, uh, the mantle and the, the shell of the organism. And it's within this fluid that the actual shell is produced, either aragonite or calcite. And the organism, uh, the mollusk, will bring carbon into that fluid and pump protons out. And that'll cause the bicarbonate to dissociate into CO3, which then bonds with calcium or magnesium to form magnesium calcite or, or regular calcite or aragonite. 
So to, un to understand how acidification impacts organisms, you really need to understand how the pH of this fluid is responding to acidification of the surrounding water. <clears throat> this is uh, just a geochemical model uh, which kind of illustrates the effect that proton removal from this fluid can have on carbon ion concentration at the site of calcification. For an organism that removes a, a large number of protons, a strong proton pump, you can actually have an increase in carbon ion concentration with increasing CO2. Compared with a weak proton pumping organism, your carbon ion concentration would decrease. So in theory, you could generate uh, a positive parabolic or even a negative calcification response for an organism with a strong intermediate or weak proton pump. So we want to figure out what kind of proton pumps mollusks have. So we worked with the model organism to develop a new technique. Uh, we worked with the Atlantic sea scallop, and we drilled ports uh, into the shell, which spanned three points throughout their paleo, extra paleo fluid. We then covered the ports uh, with uh, paraffin, paraffin wax, paraffin wax. Uh, let the let the scallop reacclimatize re to the high CO2 conditions, and then we uh, we developed a uh, pH microelectrode. It's really uh, used for, um, it's been used to measure the calcifying fluid of corals. We, we applied it in that capacity once, and it's used by uh, cell physiologists to do electrochemistry on cells. And uh, we made the tip um, a little bit wider to make it more stable so that we can insert it through the paraffin wax and through the port, and then we went into the extra paleo fluid, but stopped before we hit the mantle. And uh, we did this for scallops that were grown at three CO2 levels for two months, 400, about um, uh, 800, and about 2,200 microatmospheres. And this is what seawater pH was like under those four CO2 levels. And when we measured uh, extra paleo fluid pH under these conditions, it was shown here for the three temperature treatments. So uh, under the 400 level, your your um, Extra paleo fluid pH was right about here. Here it was under 800, and then it dropped down to about 2200. <clears throat> it dropped down to about 6.8 under the 2200 pCO2 level. One minute, okay. So this shows two things. It shows that the, the pH of the extra paleo fluid is responding to acidification of the external seawater. So it is, in, it is in connection, at least for the scallops, and it is responding. But the offset. Is, uh, is decreasing, oops, the offset is decreasing as CO2 levels increase. This suggests that the scallops are actually working harder to get closer, to get closer to seawater pH levels under pH stress than under non-pH stress. So this could have implications for their energy budgets and the amount of energy they're diverting from tissue production and reproduction towards the calcification process. So if you were to plot that response onto, uh, uh, onto uh, calcification site carbon ion space in the model that I recently showed, you'd actually fall down here. So mollusks aren't strong, moderate, or weak. They actually are maintaining calcifying fluid pH below seawater, so way down the carbon ion curves. So you would predict a negative response for that type of species. Uh, the fact that the, the mussels had no calcification response to elevated CO2 and that their crystal structure and habit was basically identical across all treatments suggests that uh, a hypothesis is that the muscles are going to fall closer up here. They, these are going to be strong proton pumping uh, bivalves. And any other uh, bivalve that is resistant, such as the limpet, should, should also fall kind of in the, in the high pH space, while the more vulnerable uh, bivalves are going to fall in the lower uh, pH space, weak proton pumpers. And if you compare that, uh, that response in the scallops, to the, uh, the pHs predicted on the model, you would predict a similarly sloped uh, calcification response. All right, so just to summarize um, the, the four projects, so the initial results of our life stage comparison uh, are fairly inconclusive. The lipids appear to be more resistant uh, at the adult stage and uh, less, more vulnerable at the juvenile stage, while the oysters are the opposite. Juveniles are more resilient than the adults. Um, for all the species we looked at, OA had an extremely negative uh, impact on shell ultrastructure. The arrangement of individual crystals and um, ultrastructural features of the shell 
were negatively impacted under the highest CO2 conditions, except for the muscles and the scallops. And we want to use uh, uh, the microelectrode technique to test the hypothesis that that is because they are manipulating the capillary fluid pH uh, more efficiently than the other species. And the dissolution experiments show the temperature has a very large impact on dissolution rates. So in a, in a warmer, higher CO2 ocean, not only do we have slower calcification, but we also have higher dissolution rates. <clears throat> and it also showed uh, that there's background dissolution going on across all saturation states in the ocean that mollusks are constantly fighting against. Uh, and the uh, microelectrode approach, a novel approach, was developed for getting into that calcifying fluid without disturbing it, which is a challenging thing to do which allowed us to measure how that calcifying fluid pH responds to acidification of the mollusks surrounding uh, seawater. And that will allow us to constrain the model of calcifying fluid pH in response to acidification and make predictions about how, uh, how acidification will actually impact calcification at the calcification site of calcification beneath the mantle. That wraps it up. Happy to take any questions. A few quick questions, yeah. but then we're going to have to move on. Um, mussels uh, grow in really dense aggregates. Um, um, do you think they could change their local environment um, to reduce the, the uh, aragonite saturation? So that could be sort of an evolutionary reason why they can survive in a greater range, so they can live in their dense community. So you think, so just the respiration, they're naturally making it more well, acidic. They're, they're, yeah. they're, you know, there's water between them and their circulation is reduced and they're sucking all the calcium out of the water. Yeah, and, and lipids do a similar thing. And they also had a positive response. That's that's a, that's a good idea. I hadn't thought about it, of, of why they would have evolved these. I thought they were all just doing it to fight the effects of acidification. But uh, yeah, although oysters also live in these dense clusters and they actually have pretty high DIC levels and they seem to have very little control over their petroleum fluid pH. But it's definitely something worth uh, thinking about. So you, you're suggesting that proton pumping is a control of the pH. Does anybody think, know anything about the isoelectric point of the different proteins that are part of that matrix? Could that also be a factor that there are just there's some fundamental kind of genetic differences that, that play in? Well, I mean, there's been a lot of work showing the effect of proteins on calcium carbonate nucleation and, and growth. So certain proteins lower the free energy at the site of, at that surface. And that will induce uh, mineralization on, uh, at, on that organic template. That's kind of how these organic templates work. Once the growth kind of starts, the, the proteins then become more like um, concrete forms in a foundation that they're used to shape the growth as opposed to initiate it. So the proteins are used throughout the whole process of calcification, from nucleation to arrangement of the crystals to arrangement of the macrostructure of the shell. Um, yeah. I just wonder if there's just one really simple parameter that could be formulated. I mean, it gets complicated. Yeah. Right. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, we are going to move on to the 2017 project, so we're going to have a short break, so if you guys want to stand up, we're going to get started in just a couple minutes. Um, it looks like yours is working fine, I just didn't know show up your email. I know, I saw that, you were very, very, very discreet. <laughs> Um, Dr. Schweiger is going to go first because he's got another arrangement, but then I'll have you. Oh, that's fine. Okay. I, I hope, hope if we get it done fast enough, I can stay through the whole thing. I've got to leave about 15 minutes for this because we're so far from the end. I put myself in too tight. I'm fine. I'll let you know. Take a long time. I'll let you know. I'll let you know. He's working on the continuous ASD sensor. And Johnson, if you want to use that, you can. Oh, there it is. Yeah.
So this would be this is I think the next two presentations would be a little different. We're on the sensing side, building up uh, you know capability. We're at a fairly I would say early stage of development. So this is going to be a little more fundamental than uh, about how you make make sensors. So we have a team here. Uh, we have uh, my colleague Jeff Lang here, who is our electrical engineer, and Vera and 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 Suchel are all well. Vera's out right now, but. Um, they're both here, and Rong, who is uh, he's given us some uh, initial results here. But um, but anyway, the, the the motivation here, and this was really uh, this this project was really stimulated by discussions with Chris, uh, is that that really uh, to to really understand the ocean, you need you know to be able to to monitor it just basically everywhere would be the ideal thing. If you could just basically put things everywhere. In the ocean and be able to get a kind of big data comprehensive view of this. And and his his feeling was that that uh, the distributed sensors that you can get from chemical sensing, which is a core aspect of my research group, would be a good way to go at that, where we can get away from taking samples, coming back to a laboratory, but really deploying things. And there's there are some very good technology out there, and and uh, yet the uh, there's still room for you know new innovations, clearly in things that are cheaper or can be autonomous, having energy harvesting capabilities. There's many uh, things I think that need to be done to really fully realize that dream. And so, one of the things that we specialize in is very low power sensors. We even have sensors that can be inductively powered by a cell phone and read at five five centimeters. So. So we, we uh, focus a lot on electrical devices that can have these very low power uh, uh, requirements. And 
the good thing about that is that can give you something that can persist for a long time if you're going to leave it unattended out in, a, in, a, in an environment. And so, um, so anyway, we'd like to uh, to really to get at how we can develop uh, new things. Or, like I said, there are some very good technologies out there. The baseline is is high, and we're we're not we're going to have we're going to have our uh, our work cut out to uh, to really uh, try and compete with these existing technologies. But the way we're uh, going about doing this is kind of a kind of general scheme that we use in our research group, where uh, we make use of molecular recognition by and large, and we design, I mean, we build molecules by and large. Uh, that's mainly people stand in front of their hood most of the time. We, we do measurements, but they spend a lot of time in front of a fume hood. And if you're familiar with IFET type sensors, they tend to be, they have some molecular characteristics that give them some specificity, but but they're not really receptors or things that, that will have the ultimate discrimination that you might want to get really high precision measurements. And so, uh, so we want to integrate uh, molecular recognition into devices. And, and one platform that we work with in our research group is a simple chemi resistor, where you just have two electrodes that are that are that have carbon nanotubes between them, and you affect the resistance of the carbon nanotubes. Um, and then that's something that we'll look at in parallel because it turns out once you make these molecules, you can apply them to multiple systems and learn about them. Uh, but we're also going with, with Jeff Lang to work on different uh, uh, field effect devices, where in this case, we're doing kind of a hybrid of a conventional, well, not a you know semiconductive technology. In his case, he has some, uh, some we'll talk about it in a moment. He has some uh, fancy ways of going at looking at these bets, but use essentially the chemistry to essentially change the voltage of the gate electrode. So rather than having a wire, you notice there's no wire attached to that gate electrode. It's being uh, entered, it's being affected by the chemistry. So, so in terms of the field effect transistor type devices, uh, this is you know a scheme that Jeff has that I will not muddle through it. But maybe you could, you could tell him a little bit about what this does. Let me just back up one slide. Just to... The picture on the upper right shows a field effect transistor, and the current through it is its output in the blue drain and in the source. And you can see there's a current meter showing you some indication of the current passing through there. What, what controls that output is the voltage, as Tim said, between the orange electrode and the green substrate. The voltage between that electrode involves a closed loop, which goes all the way out into the ocean to the reference electrode, back through the ocean to the, to the top gate electrode. And any disturbances along that closed loop path can cause a signal which will be reflected in the current. We would like to get rid of any of those noises, particularly interactions at the uh, reference electrode. And so here we'll borrow from the uh, folks who make um, electrocardiogram uh, sensors. It's always a, a three-point measurement on a person. There are two active sensors, two electro active electrodes, and the measurement difference between them and the reference electrode is, is distant, um, far down on your leg. And that's what's happening here. The sense electrode and the reference electrode would be two identical electrodes facing the ocean, just as they were in the previous ISPEC. One of them will be chemically active, and one of them will be not. So they'll have an absolutely identical interaction with, um, with the ocean. They're side by side, except for the chemistry that's put on one of them. And then it's that very small difference, which is measured by the circuit, and the absolute voltage with respect to the ocean and the reference electrode somewhere else is, is uh, inconsequential. And, and secondly, this um, circuit communicates to wherever is the sensor through a current, which is much less, uh, much less noisy communications path than through voltage. So that's a little detail of the current yeah. there. So that's great. So, so what you'll see today is our presentation is going to be a little more conceptual than maybe some of the others because we have limited data. In fact, is we're scheduled to start the project in in August. So, but we we do have some results. We've got a little bit of a head start here from wrong too. But so how these kind of idea of how you make these electrodes essentially charge or, or change the voltage on them is really by taking uh, <laughs> molecules that you put in electrochemical equilibrium with them, and then you perturb their essentially redox potential, their energies, 
by binding ions. And so if you bind carbonate or uh, uh, bicarbonate to these, you, uh, you will put a negative charge in and it'll stabilize positive charge. So you essentially can transfer more electrons to charge the electrode more negative. Similarly, if you protonate something, you can go the opposite direction. Protons will tend to uh, destabilize more positive charge on the molecules. And so what, what is key to really make things that are highly effective in this is to come up with molecules that, one, are redox active, so they tend to, to do this equilibrium very aggressively, but also to figure out uh, ways that maybe even go beyond just the simple electrostatic stabilization, which would be the simplest method, but also to use kind of structural changes within the molecule. So this is a molecule we've been playing around with in our group for a while that actually undergoes essentially a change in shape when it oxidizes. So what you can imagine doing here is take these molecules now and put them into receptors, and we'll show you some of these, wherein if you bind something that has a different physical size, it will stress the molecule and can change this equilibrium or change the relative energies of the two of them. So that's a way that you can get kind of a double whammy. It's not a purely electrostatic, but yet a structural change also. So the idea here is one scheme would be a very simple, kind of a simplest kind of baseline scheme for us is to make this molecule that you can see how it can essentially inscribe bicarbonate into it through a hydrogen bonding. These groups here happen to be very effective hydrogen bonding groups and uh, create something that can be selected. So we've made this molecule, Ron Vu has made this. Uh, the, the synthesis, just to show you what we mainly do <laughs> a lot of our time. But what he did is also these are known to bind chloride ion. And so what he did very quickly is to take a, something called nuclear magnetic resonance spectrum of this that basically shows these protons here. And you can see that those two in particular shift very dramatically. You see other changes within the molecule. It clearly binds uh, chloride very nicely. Done some computation on understanding the mechanisms here, and these are just computed structures with no ions, and then when you put chloride, and he computed also for, for nitrate in this case. And, and what you can see here is that we are seeing some small changes in the, uh, in some changes in these angles that he's showing here, that the same angle that we have, and that nitrate is essentially flexing it out a little more. Okay, so uh, so the way just to start with this to do kind of initial scheme to see if we kind of do we have something that has potential uh, utility. What we've done is some simple electrochemistry on these molecules, and this is done in a cedar nitrile, which is not water. It's very different than water. We're kind of stacking the deck a little bit. Water, uh, you know. We'll have to see how it will work, but also we're doing this in solution. And when we do things in the end, they'll be in thin films. So the environment is going to be somewhere between water and organic solvents. So we, we chose a pretty polar organic solvent to start with. But what you can see here is that at different scan rates, uh, we, we can see that we see a shift to negative potential. That is, the molecule is willing to give up its electrons more freely when it binds chloride in this case. <coughs> And the, this, the fact you get a little bigger shift when you go smaller means that we're, we're not at equilibrium here. We're in some sort of kinetic phase. But, but that's just a way we kind of look at that. Because eventually, in a sensor, it's going to be an equilibrium type uh, device. Um, and we also have done the same thing. And we see, again, see the negative shift here. You can see that two peaks growing in here is nitrate binding. Here, and we get a little bigger signal, which is good. We expected that from the size of some kind of competitive, you've seen both free and, and unbound uh, groups at these higher rates. We see it a little bit of it also here in this. So the nitrate is not binding as strongly. Nitrate is actually a very weak hydrogen bonding ligand. So, so nitrate, we expect carbonate will be better. We haven't done that uh, just yet. but. Um, but we're also moving towards things that maybe will have a little <coughs> more pre-organization. So if you want to bind things, it's kind of like the catcher's mitt. If the catcher's mitt is really floppy, it's hard to grab that ball. But if it's, if it's really nicely formed the right structure for the baseball, if you get it in there, the baseball just sticks. And so what we need to do is create three-dimensional 
structures like this. This is one that's designed to clamp in threefold the carbonate ion right in the middle. And there's some very good precedent for this. There was a, another receptor that was not electroactive made that, that was shown to bind uh, nitrate ions, but nitrate and carbonate are very similar in, in size. And, uh, and so we're also looking to go after pH. <coughs> Here, what we're making use of is uh, different kinds of platforms that are two seconds. Oh, very good. I'll be really done in just a sec. That, that make use of functionalization of carbon nanotubes or graphene. We have some chemistry we've developed, different ways that we can affect a pH here. We'd like to see how, how effective that is. And then just in a very simplified system like this, we, we have the chemistry under control and, and go further. And we've also previously worked on uh, electroactive polymers. These are polymers that basically are kind of like big electron reservoirs. Uh, where we have these become these protons on the nitrogens become acidic when it's oxidized. And this is a polymer called polypyrrole that doesn't do this reversibly, but when we put this complicated scaffold, we kind of call it a canopy, it kind of they look a little bit like, you know, you might have a canopy over uh, Fred Flintstone's car. So what I always thought of it as looking like it tends to keep the polymer chains apart and allows the protons to, to go in and out. So uh, so anyway, we have some, some challenges here. Uh, the one thing anybody that does sensors, drift is your biggest enemy, right? It's something that we really want to, and hopefully Jeff's electronics and things will help us deal with that. So we need to have some very robust chemistries that help us do that. We have to worry about fouling, and then specificity is really key. So how do we basically, we're going to have other halide ions we want to buy, we want to see Inter dissolved inorganic carbon and, uh, and and have stuff that are very specific for that. So that's what I, I have here. Yes? Um, well, I don't know any, much about the chemistry of, of uh, mineral, biomineralization, but can you look at the, the active sites of the proteins, say, involved in biomineralization to get molecular designs that, say, can bind and do a big conformational change or signal? Basically, is there, are there, there is, I mean, you, the bio you know, bio, biomimetic things in terms of designing recognition and specificity are really central to a lot of things. A lot of times they're not known or they're just, they're just too complex. I mean, it's just, it is, as chemists, we're, we can make things, but trying to say, like, I'm going to arrange all these things just so in three dimensions right, right. is, you know, it, it, it might that, be doable. It might be impractical. Side, not the whole. Yeah, no, exactly. But it, but 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 what we tend to work with, we try and choose some scaffolds that we think that are synthetically accessible. That also, we if we can get to them fairly quick, then we can start tweaking, and we we need to change things and just tweak it around and make design changes as we go. So we tend to stay with this. May not look like simple chemistry, but I would say simple things. I mean, relative to what is really possible. So, but the biomimetic things, there's definitely a lot to learn from nature. All right, next up we're gonna have okay. Dr. Wayne. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I'm uh, Alec Wong from uh, uh, Who's for Smart Graphic. Um, so uh, this is a new project. Uh, and thank you for Chris and you know the MIT sequence. This is good uh, opportunity for for this development. Um, so uh, I don't have much time, so I'm gonna just go through some of the basic uh, logics and uh, methodology we try to use to develop sensors. Uh, this in this particular case is the. Uh, dissolving organic carbon and uh, PCO2. So I'm a carbonate chemist. Um, so one thing uh, over the years, um, I found it's, it's very difficult to work with the we call the CO2 system is, is uh, it's really hard to measure this um, precisely, you know. Um, and uh, in, in the case of social acidification, and this is basically the, the signal we are, we're looking at, you know, the change of uh, pH here is the time series of uh, various uh, time series of stations in the ocean. Uh, you know, if you look at the, the numbers there, uh, 
it's on the order of 0 0.001 to 0 0.003 uh, pH unit. So that's a, a per year. So that's a rather um, small changes analytically. I mean, you, you may think this is a, you know, the biological, um, in terms of biological and ecological responses, this is a big change uh, for, for biology and, and others. Uh, but analytically, this is really hard to measure. The reason, one of the reason is that uh, the, the, the seawater is well buffered. You know, it's, it's a pH 8. You have a, a BAC concentration on the order of 2,000 micromole per kilo seawater. Uh, so, so, and then that, that bit of the pH change can translate it to uh, something uh, like on the order of um, 1 to 2 micromole BAC change in ocean. You know, that, that, that's kind of, so we call the anthropogenic CO2 invasion, you know, uh, 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 Scott is doing a lot of modeling of this, and then we did observation. This is one uh, paper Scott actually co-authored on this. Um, you know, this is a, basically uh, a decade of uh, data, uh, you know, two cruises uh, uh, separated by a, a decade uh, in time. And then we do this all through bottles. You know, this is bottles as well. Uh, you know, this costs millions of millions of dollars to do just, just this kind of graph. Um, so it's really a challenge. Uh, on top of that, um, the system is complex, uh, so we, we cannot just rely on one measure one thing to define the system. Uh, you know, there are basically four measurable, I mean, right now it's maybe an arguable, there's an, another parameter like the uh, carbonate the ion. Some people can measure it uh, pre precisely. But, you know, in general, there are four uh, uh, measurable parameters. You measure two, you can calculate the rest. But which two you measure really matters, okay? So, and if you're in this field, uh, you know, I can say is that uh, uh, most of people believe that you have to measure DAC uh, because uh, that's, that's a kind of master variable. If you measure that, you can compare with either pH or uh, PCO2, then calculate the rest. And that calculation is uh, relatively robust relative to others. Uh, unfortunately, if you have pH and PCO2 sensors, like uh, what we have commercially, um, that calculation, uh, you know, resolve uh, quite a bit of uncertainty. So that, you know, this kind of certainty may be okay for a lot of coastal studies, but not okay for ocean acidification. You know, if you want to detect the decadal changes, that, that's, that's, that's already beyond that. Uh, uh. So it's, you know, so that, that's kind of the goal we try to develop sensors uh, more like on this uh, order of precision and accuracy. So it's a really hard uh, job to actually to do it. Uh, another challenge is we try to push the envelope further is, you know, except maybe pH at this moment, um, other parameters, it take a lot of time to actually make one measurement. You know, in a, in a PCO2 or FCO or, or a DIC or alkalinity, uh, you, you take about 10, 15 minutes, sometimes even longer, to do one titration or one equilibration to get one measurement. So that we try to, you know, improve on, you know, see whether we can do better than that. Uh, so with those kind of challenges, we, so last maybe four or five years, we, uh, we, we developed a, a first version of this in situ uh, sensor we call a channelized optical system. So we try to uh, tackle the, the two challenges I just mentioned, uh, but you know this particular version, I think we addressed the, the kind of the first one, which is uh, make two measurements at the same time. So uh, one is the, the pH, uh, and the other is the DAC. So we we we, uh, we have the system basically have uh, two independent optical channels. Uh, we use the spectrometric method uh, to detect the pH. Uh, and, and the DIC is uh, at the same time. So, um, so there, there's a, uh, basically the, the design is for, uh, for this one particularly uh, designed for uh, kind of time series development, uh, deployment, uh, you know, you can put this on uh, buoys, for example. Um, uh, so <laughs> it's relatively large, you know, you can see the size relative to the, to the people. Um, and this is actually the, some uh, data we collected the, the off, uh, shore of, of Hawaii. Um, and the, the precision is re relatively good. You know, the, this is the DIC uh, uh, measurement in terms of compared to the standard 
uh, bottom measurement. Uh, this is uh, relatively uh, close to what do we really want in terms of detect, detecting uh, ocean acidification signals. But I will say this this one still run about 10 minutes cycle. So it's 10, you know, you can already do a continuous because the, the design of the pump is not continuous. It's small dosage, but it's not continuous. So, so that bring up to the this this particular project. So we want to basically miniaturize that 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 sensor and uh, and adding another capability, which is measure uh, PCO2. Um, so and there's a couple of reasons we want to do the PCO2 over the pH. So let's kind of list uh, uh, some of them. There's maybe another one, uh, but the major one is actually. Um, for particular for pH measurement, down to S3 water, you know, low salinity water, there's no good measurement. Um, it's just not very accurate. So you can take electrode method or you, you could take spectrometric measurement. Um, it's, it's not very accurate defined. That, that, that measurement is not well defined in low salinity water. It's well defined in open ocean, you know, salinity 35, but it's not well defined in the salinity 10. So that just, it's just very complica complicated. Um, so, so, so we think instead of doing pH, <coughs> so uh, we can use, we can measure PCO2. So the PCO2 has, in terms of uh, the method we use, you know, spectrophotometric, um, has less salinity effect, or basically no salinity effect, actually. Um, so, so that, that's, that's a very important, you know, if you, if you want to measure precisely a carbonate system, in the, in the low salinity water, this is probably a, a better pair to use. Um, so there, you know, and, and there's a couple of things, you know, like uh, uh, less prone to the to the clarity of, of water, um, and uh, and these two methods actually are uh, very similar. So you can you can just kind of duplicate uh, two channels and make a measure uh, a measure design is relatively um, uh, straightforward and compact. And then we're really shooting for a high frequency measurement. We'll see whether we can do uh, kind of continuous measurement. Um, this is the methodology we're trying to use, apply to both um, parameters. So we basically have some kind of um, uh, gas permeable um, micro tube in the, in the center. And outside that tube, we, we can direct uh, your seawater sample I can be acidified or well not acidified. In a acidified case, you convert all of the carbonate species to dissolve the CO2 molecule, and then the CO2 is gonna equilibrate with some uh, some uh, pH sensitive indicator inside. Uh, once it's equilibrated, then you can detect the color of that indicator, and then, then from that you can actually calculate what is the uh, CO2 concentration in the indicator flow in the indicator. Uh, uh, solution and that equivalent because the equilibrium uh, equivalent to the outside uh, CO2 concentration <coughs> or uh, DSE concentration. Um, but we did some improvement on this so we can actually control the flow rate very well. Uh, you know, let this indicator flow through the tube. So, you know, at this moment, uh, you know, when the fact, you know. If you enter right at, enter right at the, the entrance of that tube, uh, the, the, there's no CO2 equilibration, but by the time it exit, it reached uh, some uh, you know, 100% equilibration, and then we can detect that. Uh, so the way, if you do this, you know, response time is relatively short, and also you can actually do kind of flow through detection, you can, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the one hertz measurement. Um, so, so for, for this particular project, uh, instead of using, I mean, that, that's kind of the previous version of the uh, CO2 equilibrator. And for this particular uh, version, uh, for, we want to uh, build a, a um, millifluidic um, manifold. So, so put, basically convert that tube into the channels of this kind of sandwich uh, manifold. So on one side, you still have uh, seawater channel. The other side is the indicator channel, and then between them is a film of uh, semi-permeable uh, membrane. 
So there's a, you know, obviously a lot of uh, uh, advantages to doing this is that you minimize the connections uh, and this is really easy, easy to swap, uh, maintain, uh, especially for the users. Um, and, and then we can, we can, we think we can reduce the size of the overall uh, sensor and also the, uh, the uh, reagent consumption. So we actually, I mean, the last, uh, we just started this a couple of months ago. So actually we set up this uh, bench top in the lab. So this, this is a kind of, uh, without, without that manifold yet, but we uh, managed to uh, set up some of the uh, micro pumps. You know, this, this is the size of uh, about a coin, you know, slightly larger coin. Uh, and this is the bore. So the whole thing is about seven, eight inches across and six inches Okay, um, so so we just starting doing this. This is the kind of the pump. You can see the size of it. Okay, um, uh, but this is still uh, the tubing design, which is this little coil there. It's the length of that is about uh, uh, two meters. Um, so this is a design strategy, as I said, low power, low cost. Um, the size try to fit it on some of the uh, mobile platforms. Uh, smaller and uh, have lower reagent um, consumption. And this is the, we propose to do probably two uh, testing. Uh, one is using the CTD, you know, we're going to put the sensor in the center of the CTD rosette and then lower to certain uh, meters. And then along the way, we can take a bottle sample, compare sensor uh, measurement with a standard uh, sample, a standard bottle measurement. Um, we're going to deploy the sensor in one of the uh, LTER side in Plum Island Sun, uh, just north of this, uh, north of the campus. Uh, if we have chance, we want to put it on some of the um, AUVs. One obvious uh, candidate is the Sentry. Um, you know, I, I think you know MIT has more vehicles. You know, if, if we're, there's a chance, we can deploy that on it. Um, so. Um, the program also, uh, you know, going to train some high school students. Hopefully, they can do some engineer project uh, with us. Uh, and we're going to have a one uh, student and one postdoc work on it. So, so that's that's about it. Thank you. How, how careful do you have to control the temperature of that uh, system? Sitting out in the blue, you can see that quite a lot. That's a great question. So, uh, all of those measurements are very dependable on temperature. It's a big term. Uh, essentially, the, 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 the system measures pH because it's, it's all colorimetric, right? So, it's a pH indicator. So, you essentially measure the, the color of the indicator. And that itself is very sensitive to the temperature. But you can calibrate it, have calibration curve done either in the lab or in situ. And we can you know, compare that with a standard um, uh, samples or standard seawater. And then that, that, that's how we do it. So, so the one thing we want to do is that we're going to have some kind of in situ uh, cal calibration uh, capability. So we're going to have some standard seawater when we deploy this. So from time to time, we can calibrate against that seawater. Uh, standard seawater, so that makes sure that the system will respond, uh, you know, including temperature, is a <coughs> calibrate against the standard. So. All right, thank you very much. Okay, You're not going to do your air media? No, huh? it's, it's, it's too late in the day for air media.
sure. Slide. Am I the last talker? You are. So our last talk will be given by Dr. Tom Comfey. He's with MIT Sea Grant, representing Dr. Saxis. Yes, representing a, a group, a cast of a cast of thousands. Um, so uh, this is uh, we're at the beginning stages of our uh, of our uh, group work, um, which is a collaboration between a number of us at MIT and Sea Grant, along with. Um, Chang Sheng Chen and, and Bob Bearsley, UMass Dartmouth, and Annette Woods Hole. Um, so our title is uh, Toward a Cost-Effective Monitoring System of Coastal Ocean Acidification in the U.S. Northeast. Okay, so the need, well, um, I always like to go back to, to fundamentals when you think about oceanography or the history of oceanography. It's really the co-development of technology and science to, uh, to solve the sampling problem. You know, first you you dumped a net in the water and pulled it up and saw all the hard stuff, and then you actually put cameras in and were able to see the soft things. You went from one point um, temperature measurement to profiles, and then eventually, you know, research boats doing two dimensional, and now with AUVs, you can do three dimensional. So the oceans, um, or even a smallish bay, is a large, complex system composed of many things biological, chemical, and phys physical that are going on at different time scales. And so our our fundamental sampling problem is you've got to measure at least twice the frequency of the highest frequency component of whatever you're interested in in order to back out the signal or in order to get useful information. So it all goes back to uh, Shannon's uh, sampling theory. Um, so we basically need to put our sensors in the right place at the right time and the right frequency. Okay. But the problem is um, adequately instrumenting even a small section of the ocean is, is, is costly. Um, and uh, if you look at coastal ocean acidification, we have a really complex problem. We have a complex environment, um, you know, both land meeting sea <coughs> and air. And um, you have lots of currents. You have very irregular coastlines. You have a lot of humans living around there, which actually is one of the problems, right? And importantly, a freshwater input from rivers. So you've got these big gushes of water, which is not like um, ocean water, it's intrinsically acidic and also reduces the buffering capacity and also can carry a lot of natural and anthropogenic compounds to, to further muck up the chemistry of the, uh, of the uh, coastal environment. Um, because of the nutrients in the coast, there's high biological activity, which also is responsible for diurnal huge swings in, in pH and, of course, contaminants and pollution. Um, so, um, I mean, when I... Uh, um, I, years ago, I was in the early days, I was involved with uh, early development of AUVs here, and I left for a while and came back, and then I was sort of came into this group that was formulating some ideas for ocean acidification, um, sensing and sampling networks, and I was kind of disappointed because everybody was saying, well, we need sample from here, we need sample from there. And I thought, well, where are the AUVs? Where's my thousand AUVs that I can just dump in the water and get my sampling? Well, um, it turns out, I mean, there are still engineering problems to solve in the area of AUVs, but it's largely, actually, I would say, economics rears its ugly head. And uh, we can't have all the sensors and the platforms that we want, OK? So and then I, I learned something new from uh, George Karniadakis, a colleague of ours and a applied mathematician who's looking into an area of mathematics that I don't understand too much called big data. And what it reminded me of um, is in World War II, although I'm not that old, I like to read history, um, there was a small group of scientists in Britain that said, hey, you know, science, uh, scientists up to now have been mostly developing new weapons um, to fight in the war. Um, but if you look at an, the time between a new weapon development and its actual deployment, it's a long time. It may not affect the actual problem to solve. So they started looking at how we can use what we have more effectively. And that was the birth of an area of mathematics called operations research. And that actually resulted in a lot of uh, interesting developments in a whole field of industrial and mathematical research. So what we're proposing sort of is in, a, in this philosophy of operations research. Now, there's, you know, if you look in um, the Charles River, every river has its watershed association. So people have been taking data for decades, maybe centuries. Um, and that data is of varying quality, varying fidelity, as I would say. Um, so if you were sort of the purest oceanographic snob, you could say, well, I can't use that data. 
but it is information to some degree of accuracy, which may be useful. So the idea here is you use um, mathematical methods to combine data of varying accuracy, varying fidelity, including information about that uncertainty. And uh, you, could, you can use all the data you have um, to make predictions, to uh, aid in your simulation efforts, and indeed use the results of simulation as data of a certain level of fidelity to sort of fold back in. Okay, So that's what we want to try and do. We want to take the data that already exists, take the data from existing sampling and measurement um, uh, monitoring programs, as well as you know, the, basically anybody doing research in the harbor or Mass Bay is doing measurements that could potentially be incorporated um, into this scheme, which um, uh, we call our multi-fidelity network. So in this schematic, you sort of have this feedback network where you have data of all levels of fidelity, um, cheap. Well, anybody who bought a SON might say, well, that's not really cheap. But um, it is relatively low accuracy compared to laboratory-based methods or the more um, laboratory out, you know, miniature laboratory based sensors. So, you know, your basic, uh, your basic electrode type pH sensor. And then you have the results of uh, simulation, which we're putting sort of that there. And then you have high level um, in situ sensors, you know, the, uh, what is that? The Google X Prize winners, you know, they're, they're there. And then of course, lab analysis, which is sort of your gold standard. And it can all be combined um, with, uh, with a method using something called gate deep gaussian processes. And I'm not going to go beyond that. My, unfortunately, my colleagues in the mathematical side couldn't be here today. But um, I just want to give you a sense of sort of what we're driving at here. It's an overall scheme to sort of utilize everything, you know, sort of in the MIT way of let's change the world. Um, so if I go back here, so our goal, we want to make do this methodology methodology so we can use all the available information, okay? And um, so we, uh, again, propose to use this method called deep gaussian processes, so allow us to combine data, and also in the simulations, in the results, you don't just get, you know, here's a map of pH or here's a map of aragonite concentration, you also get a map of uncertainties. So this uh, multi-fidelity scheme is actually, you can look at it as a giant feedback control system involving our beloved AUVs, because we can then look at the results and say, here's where we have to sample. Here's where we have to put our expensive assets. Let's send the fleet there. And of course, that's going to change. You know, there's, there's decadal trends. There's also local episodic things like storms and, and, uh, and disasters of various kinds. So we're sort of building this hopefully universal or kind of universal feedback system for uh, using data um, to make better simulations and then to have it feedback and say, OK, here is where we need to put our efforts. OK, um, so our methodology um, and everything in red is sort of where we have had progress. We've really, our, our project is just two, two months old or two or three months old. OK, so first is we're going to develop the mathematics, or we are developing the mathematics. And then we'll be um, working with uh, uh, rather uh, Chen and uh, Bob Beardsley uh, establish a biogeochemistry and ecosystem model, which is a combination of, called FBCOM and ESREM, um, to basically add uh, um, the ability to predict ocean acidification parameters. It adds the biogeochemistry and the microbes. Um, and then we're going to tweak our sampling a little bit. And there's you know MWRA has a massive sampling effort in the harbor, in the rivers, and in Mass Bay. We're going to augment those samples with uh, bottled uh, laboratory-based measurements, um, in particular of uh, what DIC and alkalinity. Okay, and then we're also going to create a continuous monitoring station at Deer Island, which will have a will sort of a conventional sensor uh, package, a sonde on a buoy, but with a micro a miniature weather station. So when we get precipitation, wind, and things like that, it's not at Logan Airport. It's two feet above the surface of the water where we're making our measurements. So I think that's actually kind of interesting and unique. I'd like to deploy 10 million of those. Um, and we're also in the large cement pier coming out from Deer Island. We're going to be mounting some high accuracy PCO2 and pH sensors. Not all that different from Alex's sensors. Okay. 
Um, this is a bit of a progress report that was given to us by Chen and uh, his colleagues. Um, so that what they've done so far is they've taken their um, FVCOM, which is a finite volume coastal ocean model, which is a hydrodynamic model that predicts flow. And they're looking at it with sort of their current um, water quality model, which is called UGRCA. I always like to know what in the world these things mean. This is unstructured grid, grid row column advanced model. And they're making predictions of a lot of uh, parameters for 2016, basically to make sure that FVCOM is well adapted to our operational arena, which is more or less the Boston Harbor, especially Boston Inner Harbor, which I don't think has been modeled that, that much. Maybe I'm wrong. Okay. And then they're also adapting the ERSM model, which is the new, basically the uh, enhancement instead of UGRCA, they're going to this one, which again has the biogeochemistry and the, and the microbes, the European Regional Seas Ecosystem Model, and get that up and running. Okay. So um, basic. So this is uh, what they're using as data to truth their uh, predictions, their model simulations, basically the uh, MWRA sampling stations throughout the Mass Bay and the harbor. And this just shows you some of the results of, again, their FDCOM and UGRCA of predictions of temperature and salinity. And it's hard to see, but um, the predicted predictions and the, uh, and the model results pretty much overlap uh, for temperature and salinity. Um, and then this is a very busy chart, but it also shows a lot of other parameters um, or several other parameters. There's salinity here. Um, I'm sorry, two parameters, but at multiple stations. Okay, multiple stations being these guys all over here. Um, okay, and what it shows is this is, I think, deep. This is more shallow, um, uh, more surface sampling, and the dots are the real values and the lines are the predicted. So it shows that they can, um, basically, they've got their machines, their software machines, uh, working. Okay, and also here's DO, con dissolved oxygen concentrations. So now, having gotten that up and running, they're ad adapting. I think they already have taken this model from a lab at Plymouth Marine Labs in, in England. And this shows, this is basically a block diagram of the, uh, of the model. And in particular, it's got the, uh, the um, microbes here, phytoplankton and some biogeochemical um, um, processes in here. And what they're doing now is a series that, which is kind of interesting to me. Um, it's the first time sort of I've seen this kind of thing. 1D experiments rather than do two or 3D simulations. You do 1D where you're looking at the column from the surface of the water to the bottom. And you assume no, I guess, advection, nothing moving in there. You're just forcing at the top and the bottom, like what's coming in and what can sort of leak out the bottom. So they do these 1D essentially profile experiments to uh, and then compare it to uh, to known data. And this helps them test the model that it works and also establish uh, um, boundary conditions for the model. And uh, they've gotten uh, results with temperature. And um, so the dots are real data from, from, from a buoy, um, a buoy that's uh, sort of off the coast of New Hampshire. This AO1, right? Um, more in the still wagon. More, yeah. Still wagon. yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. And, uh, They've actually, well, what this has shown, and the whole purpose of this one one dimensional business is to uh, to test the model and to see, look at flaws. They got some non correspondence and they track that down to um, some bad, uh, bad parameters, I guess, um, in terms of fluxes, heat fluxes, <coughs> benthic uh, heat fluxes, and they now can change that and optimize it. So the next steps basically is to uh, um, make sure that the combination of FVCOM and ERSM, basically FVCOM drives ERSM, um, make sure it can do the simulations over the area we're interested in. So then when we start bringing in our new data and just in general, the new MWRA data comes in, we can do the simulations. Okay, um, so as far as other, so a lot of work is being done on the modeling front. And as far as our sampling effort is concerned, well, this is the sort of the total MWRA sampling map. We've got samples in the river and the harbor and out here in the bay. And pretty much we have four 
of their stations out in the Bay, Mass Bay, F23, N04, and 18. Where's the outfall? F22. The outfall is right there. Okay, this is no, where I'm no, 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 no. It's out nine between, miles out. The outfall is between N18 and N21. And yeah, we, uh, way out. Yeah, yeah, okay, so yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Miles That's the end of yeah. So all right. Yeah, so you should put. You should put it. You should put probably yeah. a mark there. Whatever. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, um, um, we okay. So that's our that's our augmented symbol. So basically, we're they're taking extra bottles that we're stabilizing and then sending to Justin's lab to be analyzed. Uh, so we've started. Um, Doing some more extensive measurements uh, with SON based, uh, SONS type sensors. And of course, we use our, our current um, main uh, vehicle in the AUV lab, which is Rex, our surface vehicle. Um, and here is the vehicle. It's a catamaran type vehicle with some really ripping fast motors and uh, lots of batteries and computer on top. And a winch, most importantly, which can be winched down and using feedback. From a pressure sensor, and also using a depth depth sounder, we can make sure our okay, we can make sure our sound doesn't hit the bottom, and we can hit the right stations. Um, so what recently they did was what I call the Y mission. So um, here's here's the inner harbor, and this goes to the Charles River. So the vehicle came out and uh, went through. So sort of this is going down out to the ocean. I guess the airport would be there. And this is to the Mystic River. So this was the trajectory of the vehicle, right? And then at the diamonds, the vehicle essentially stopped and did a profile. So um, and here's just some results. This is temperature. So the colored dots are the various stations, those diamonds there. OK, and temperature uh, profile, all they all um, seem to be similar, OK? This is just like right, right out of the song. You know, it's not really done much. Um, conductivity, well, it's less conductive at the surface. And since this is an area of river inputs, and river water is less dense than seawater, it's to be expected. Getting more saline as we, we be. OK, pH is, is kind of interesting, but it does, the data does sort of show you the effects of the rivers. Sort of this would be the sort of river word samples, and this would be the ocean word samples. The pH is higher. Um, and chlorophyll, which is kind of complicated, um, but we seem to have higher levels of chlorophyll at the surface. Um, if anybody wants to comment on that, feel free. Okay. So our final um, bit of progress is Deer Island, which is right here where the sewage treatment plant is, where the big outfall comes out. This is their cement pier, and that's where we're going to set up our 24-hour <coughs> monitoring station. And it's a nice place because this is the main gap between the bay and the harbor. And for looking at exchange between the two, this is a good place to start your measurements. So we're putting a small buoy there with the sand and the mini weather station. But we're also been spending a lot of time figuring out how to, um, on their cement pier, put plumb in two. Uh, these are from a company called Sunburst. They're essentially a sort of small lab, so spectrophotometric um, um, PCO2 and high accuracy pH. And we need to plumb it in and basically pass water at a certain rate to them. But the problem is we have a 15-foot tidal cycle. When we look in this well, we first saw, oh, great, we'll just pump water out. But then we saw this is quite a lot of, quite a distance. And also, we want surface samples because we want to compare it to the uh, MWRA samples and also to our buoy. So we need a floating inlet. And we are start, it's starting to get very, very complicated. Um, here's the inside of this shed. And we don't know how hot it gets in the summer. but. Uh, um, uh, Mike Sakarni and our undergraduate, Noah Yoder, who's sitting right over there, um, worked very hard on this. And we've come up with this sort of foldable tubing arrangement where we have, here's the top, here's that hut that we're in, here's the bottom. We have two um, mooring lines, steel mooring line. And on this side, we have two pumps, which are in cascade, because um, we have to pump quite a high head. And um, this is the exit, and this line is fixed. Uh, I'm sorry, it's this line, which is fixed. And then here's a float, which has the intake, which goes up and down. And here's the line, which has to flex with the tides. And we're arranging it so that it flexes, sort of forms pleats. 
Okay, and we can give you the details on that. Okay, so that's really what I have at the moment. Um, this is sort of in the broader range. We want our multi-fidelity model, our simulations, and our real-world uh, data all to be feeding into each other so we can get progressively better simulations. Um, and I want to add in terms of um, education, we, uh, we have quite a few undergraduates and high school students, many of whom are here. And of those, um, Noah Yoder is working with the AV lab on deploying sensors. Um, Michelle Kornberg is working with me. Uh, I didn't mention one of the other legs of the four-legged tripod is uh, getting accurate river flow measurements at the mouth. And we're, going, we're working on that. And Michelle's working with me on that. Another student, um, uh, Rachel, is working. This is kind of a unique little project. We're trying to make a drifter with a pH sensor so we could look at a slug of water coming out of a river and seeing how the pH varies. Okay. So we've got also two undergraduates, um, Bailey and, uh, and Allie, working with Carolina on the sensors and also on the uh, uh, biomineralization collaboration with uh, Professor Reese. And have I missed anybody else? Well, we have a, so all of our students are basically doing vehicle and sensor related projects. Okay. So we're really folding in, as we've done with the AV lab from the beginning, um, we folded in engineering education with, with science and engineering development to enhance new science. Okay. And also train up engineers who are savvy at this kind of multidisciplinary, go out in the water, get wet kind of stuff. So that's my talk. Any uh, questions? Are you, you? I assume you're working with people from MWRA as well. You know oh, yes. that, that they do do depths with their rosette bottles. So they yeah. have they have uh, but, pH um, and yeah, so forth. There, there's air when they do depths. Yes. We want to leave yes. this. No, no, I understand. Yeah, yeah. But you said, you, yeah. no, but you said in your well you're only going to do surface. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. And yeah, I, yeah, you said, yeah. pardon me? We're going, yes, we're going with the simplest thing, kind yeah. of simplest thing yeah. first. And our big problem is if you looked in that well, I mean, it's, it's what, three foot square, uh, razor sharp barnacles, um, mm -hmm. big uh, concrete support blocks. So one could easily imagine tangling, tearing, all, all kinds of mayhem that would go on in there. Yeah. So at a first glance, when I saw it, I'm like, this is great, we're going to use it. But then once yeah. we start thinking, and we have been, actually, if people know, if people have done things like this, let us know, let us know the kind of arrangement. So we've been talking to people. And, and they basically agreed that it is a tough task if you want 24-hour uh, monitoring and with some with reasonable reliability. Meaning we can it can contact us and we have like 24 hours to get out there. Okay, so we don't have our we actually have a drone effort, but we can't fly it to uh, your hours to do autonomous repair. That's extra weird. So uh, any other questions? Yeah, oh, sure. <laughs> I've lost um, uh, fouling. <laughs> How are you going to manage that? What? Fouling of your, your equipment. Fouling? We're fouling. Go, Organisms we're gonna, growing on it. We're going to go check on the line, swap out the line probably week, a couple of weeks, every couple of weeks. Yeah. The, one of the Apparently, big problems with... Have you shown with, them a plate? We, 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 <laughs> one okay. of them is yeah, heavily involved in this effort. So, yeah. One of the problems with this tubing, anybody who's ever had a marine aquarium knows yeah. there's fouling. Yeah. And also anybody who's had a marine aquarium know that the better filters have green tubing. Okay, so we're going to use opaque tubing. And again, we'll just swap that out. Um, for fouling on the sods and stuff, we're following the convention of uh, copper, use copper mesh. We have no particularly good ideas about that just yet. Again, and, and they have wipers, right? Yeah, uh, and also as standard on a lot of it, because uh, sounds are now going more and more to optical sensors, so they all have wipers, proverbial glasses, windshield wipers. And then, and then the last thing uh, you mentioned, uh, have you? I assume you've talked to um, uh, Signal down in Huey about. I think he did some work or tried to do some work of modeling in Boston Harbor, and it was largely two-dimensional put into a three-dimensional thing. So you might want to yeah. talk to him yeah, if you I haven't already. Not, I wouldn't be surprised if, if Chairman Bob here is with Yeah, and well, they certainly know. Yeah, yeah and uh, and the other person, of course, would be Eric Adams, who oh, with with uh, Keith yeah. well, a fair Eric amount of work. Well, MIT Civil Engineering is, is on this team. Yeah. He's been actually yeah. advising us heavily on all yeah. this stuff. Yeah, okay. So we used to, for 10 years, we did the MWRA modeling for the outfall and the bacteria and the circulation and all that stuff. So Mojo used to do that. He left. Were they using the FBCOM? Uh, 
you know, well, they, they use their own model. So, um, but I, if you rem if you email me, I'll yeah, send you their contact the and they'll send you all yeah. that stuff. Yeah, the yeah. contact. So yeah. we could definitely, yeah. you know. All right. And you're welcome to use. Chicago, Charlotte, seventeen years in Central but I know I want to deploy. Um, we have on how do we communicate and how do we harvest the data. So one of the major topics that we're going to be addressing is already in our website. Uh, you can see a number of things there that we uh, becoming very obvious to us as the well the major challenges. How do we develop low power sensors? Uh, how do we communicate? How do you recharge uh, sensors? Uh, how do you work? If you spend the time right now, look at the, our current website, at least it has two or three of the major problems. The other one I'm working behind the scenes with Mars, trying to understand satellites. Um, you know, I was introduced to a very, very good person in Mars that we're trying to, trying to coordinate and see if we can come up with uh, how to incorporate satellite. And the other, my biggest problem. I mean, it was hinted by Tom as to what is, how do you forecast what the behavior is going to be in the ocean as we take it? So one of the ideas that we want to have is to go handcast and try to see if we can build it from the handcast data to see what do we need to go forward. But, you know, forecasting is really a major uh, element that uh, we need. So I invite all of you to write to Mike Sandafilo, who is the new director. Even if you send it to me, I'll make sure that you forward it uh, to him. The next input is going to be sometime in November, uh, where we will ask our constituents to see what uh, areas. But we are heavily inclined to go with some of the major problems that NOAA is facing, which is uh, recharging of sensors and AUDs, communication of data. So these are the sort of things come then to extend uh, what I believe is NASA is paying quite a lot of money to see if I can use the data, their data to actually capitalize on that. That is really a major thing. But you are very welcome to, as I said, come and tell us that no, we want to do something else. And you know, I'm a strong minded individual. <laughs> you're going to convince me that uh, you are very much. But um, at any rate, uh, I mean, four years ago, you know, I had to rely on you. To get started, you know, all of you have played a significant role in the start of my education. And now we are, uh, you know, building on this. Um, you know, I think it's a, we have a lot of nice mixture of projects. And I'm hoping that, you know, at least today's meeting was useful in that at least we met each other. And if you have uh, any questions, you can, you know, Ask us to help you find 
the right partner or you know you now know the name and you can go start the phone. But you know it's really we have to focus our resources because there are we are not going to be richer with you know if anything we might be very poor for this one but uh, but you know it's I'm hoping at least we will maintain maintain status quo. So with that uh, thank you for coming, and uh, on behalf of Mike, who unfortunately had to be in Singapore, uh, I think, uh, again, many thanks for all of your efforts, and let's keep up the good work. Yeah. Oh, I forgot. Oh, my but you can see you since the next so I wouldn't expect it to be a lot of fun. All right. Thanks. So, one of them, I don't think you just wondered whether or not I should make my own way or if I should wait for my own. Probably the boss is hard. I'm pretty sure why I'm not trying to do that. So it's a real problem. Yeah, yeah. It's a yeah. And then there was a, the people from Long Island now that I know connected with the their version of biology model. Yeah. For the mass spay, and you know, um, they could get they could get the you know, nutrients to make, to do a much better job. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Like a model, but they also would throw in water. Yeah. 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 And then every now and then, you know, they predict this and they spike for chlorophyll would go way up. So there's a group of you who made this to them. We're working with this in this really cool thing. Oh, that's right. Physical astronomy. Yeah. With all the particle transport stuff. Uh, multi columns, yeah. 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 so right. be great if we could get her to work. Right now, we're yeah. primarily yeah. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I suspect the yeah. 21st is before Thanksgiving. I'm sure, yeah. 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 I'm sure, yeah. Trent's fantastic. Uh, yeah, they don't get to uh, <laughs> We tried to steal them. And Dartmouth came back with a counter before we could move. Oh, really? Yeah. 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 yeah, we're working on it. Yeah. 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 Like we're plumbing in the summer. No longer the Let us know what it is. So that research festival is done. So I think you're yeah. 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 I mean, I you guys giving you two years off. Oh. <laughs> but I can't. Two years notice doesn't the model like. Right. 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 Tiny yeah. 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 Right, right. It's pretty much yeah. 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 Yeah, I'm <laughs> 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 <la
and well, that we were going to solve that um, by it seems to happen at the point of connection right, from the, the wires to the sensor uh, so they were going to um, basically have the connection be far away from the solution so run the wire from the electrode here and then have the clamp like that far from the just have uh, so the electrode is here. Um, do a permanent connection here, and then and then do the, the clamp here, far, further away. It used to be the clamp right here, and this is where the short circuit is. Very lightweight, high precision. Yes. So I thought we had to change that. We're still doing it that way. That, that is um, cause all you need is a little bit. Here, but. Right. What happens is you get the salt filled up here. The salt will just bypass. You'll get some signal from that, but then some signal will come out of the water. You have the salt right here. So I think you have to just don't have that far enough away. But this this needs to all be coated. I'm surprised I didn't want to tell you. I think that so if there's any if there's any exposed metal close to the solution, it's very easy for a salt salt bridge to interfere. It could just be a little bit of a range, the same of a path. And it may not completely destroy it, but it may uh, bias the primary signal. Oh, I think it was a I think it was a I think it was a so how, so are they at the point now with these, can they start to put these into the, um, have they started, is that yet? Yeah, I think it's now, make sure that they do the other audio sensor too at the same time. But they don't have, they don't have a lot of work. Yeah. Well, they have a theory. There's no reason why you can't look for something like that. So they to have a Right. Well, I call, 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 I well, I think, I think they're okay on the long tail part, because uh, we measured it, how long it takes to replenish. If we took it all out, and then we took out, and then we waited an hour, we sampled, waited two hours, we sampled, waited three hours, we sampled, we did it over that four days. So we have a timeline of how long it takes to get back to normal. Right. And it's like, it's like uh, 24 hours. So might be the but it's a cool technique. Then. That's new technique. Nobody's done that before. We extracted the fluid. So that's a new biological uh, control. 
was a huge cold call. It was amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, y